Well, I was born in Zanesville, Ohio. That's the southeast part, down by the Ohio River. And uh, I was raised in the same area, just outside of Zanesville, in a place called Dresden. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot. Small town, and uh, the people there are really nice and friendly, and um, it just felt like home. You know, the, the summers are nice and green and warm, and uh, the, it's got all the seasons, so the snow and the winter, and the changing of the trees through the fall. And it's a very beautiful place. I loved outdoor sports. Like, I was always riding dirt bikes on my grandparents' farm and uh, doing snowboarding when I grew what little snowboarding you could do in Ohio, and uh, paintballing, that kind of cool sure. outdoor stuff. Well, my father was in the National Guard uh, during September 11th. I was in the eighth grade. So I watched him deploy to Iraq and during the initial invasion there. And uh, that kind of got me exposed to the military scene. Um, I also realized uh, in high school I had to quickly make a decision. And uh, college just didn't seem like a very uh, helpful or productive use of my time. I wanted to make a difference. And so see, seeing my father's experience and uh, watching him deploy, it kind of gave me a sense of duty and, and honor. And so that's, I wanted to follow in those footsteps. Sure. I joined initially just trying to be a ranger. And uh, so the first contract that came up was medic. And uh, I got to AIT and was planning on dropping it, but they told me if I did, I would lose my bonus. So okay. <laughs> I became a medic. Uh -huh. There were moments that I that I was excited and that I was having fun, you know, yeah. like uh, FTXs and in basic and 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 AIT. But uh, I, I remember particularly having a hard time with the needle sticks mm -hmm. and with uh, getting IVs because we had to practice on each other. And uh, not that I was afraid of needles, but just the repetitive sticking of each other. I remember being like, oh, I don't know if I like this <laughs> or not, you know. Well, uh, after AIT, I went to airborne school. How was that? And that was. It was it was good. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> Did you, you like throwing yourself out of planes? <laughs> I actually learned that I had a fear of heights on my first jump, yeah. so that was that was a, probably a negative experience. But <laughs> all in all, I, I I'm proud of it. So. The the Ranger indoctrination yeah. program. I spent nine months there. Uh, I injured my knee. I uh, tore my my right PCL, and. Uh, uh, was recycled and recycled, and then eventually they told me, hey, you know, you can always come back when you're healed. So they, they sent me after nine months to uh, Alaska to be stationed up there. Uh, very, not very long. We found out we were getting deployed yeah. relatively soon after I got there. I got there in March of 2009, okay. or no, eight, two, uh -huh. March of 2008. Yeah. So a year before we deployed, I think. As we got up there, everybody was getting back from Iraq, and they were like, all right, we're training up for the uh, next deployment. Mm -hmm. I remember being excited when I found out that we were being deployed. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, thinking I had been in the Army at that point for almost uh, two years. It was going on two years. And so at that point, I was kind of restless and, and wanted to go use my, my training and my experience. I deployed uh, March 5th of 2009, and I returned uh, March 20-something of 2010. Uh, we boarded a civilian aircraft at uh, Fort Richardson. Um, we were in f full kit and everything, just no uh, no ammunition, but we carried our weapon and our uh, and one carry-on. <coughs> we, we boarded the plane and flew then from there to Germany, where we uh, changed flights and flew on to Kyrgyzstan. And uh, at Kyrgyzstan, we got we boarded a uh, military aircraft. We spent a few weeks in Kyrgyzstan trying to get paperwork sorted out, and then we boarded a military aircraft and flew into Bagram, Afghanistan. I think there was some realization at first that we that we were in a foreign country, uh, but you're right that it didn't really set in until we had uh, we had moved to to another base. Uh, we went from Bagram to Sharana. Yeah, that was where we picked up our trucks and picked up our equipment and uh, performed our left seat, right seat rides with the uh, unit that we were ripping. I was with Apache Company, and uh, our area of operation was 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 out of based out of Fab Waziqua in Paktika province. Sure. 
there were initially some some excitement uh, around actually being there and being able to perform. Um, there was some nervousness as well. We noticed that the the it was harder to breathe up at that ap- uh, up at that elevation. Uh, the people were f- were friendly at first, and uh, I had the uh, the bleeding heart medic mentality where I was just I was there to save everyone and fix everything. So I I would say my initial opinion of Afghanistan was positive. Probably two or three weeks okay. before we had uh, saw our first uh, minor ambush outside of Sharana. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I. I realized that my life was in danger for the first time uh, during our first real big mission. Uh, we were on our way to Waziqwa. We were The mission was to drive there, as no one had uh, had ever passed through those roads on on the way there. Everybody had always traveled by air. So the battalion had decided that we were going to uh, make a, a statement by doing a patrol through that uh, pass. I think if I remember right, it was called the Gwashta Pass. And um, <clears throat> that trip took several weeks, and uh, we set records for how many IEDs we hit. Uh, I, I personally treated uh, over seven casualties, uh, so mo- most of them life-threatening. Uh, and that happened all within the first month of being in Afghanistan. Most of the, I treated one American for a minor concussion, um, but most of the traumatic life-threatening injuries were Afghan nationals. And and not even in the military, they were uh, the support, like the truck drivers and the, and even just innocent civilians. So I remember that being probably the one of the largest struggles of Afghanistan was the physical, the physicality of most of the missions. <clears throat> probably the worst would have been a mission that we uh, lovingly refer to as the Hell Hike, where uh, I forget the name of the operation, but we were um, patrolling. The mountains in the south part of uh, Paktika province, and we were patrolling through there, looking for uh, training camps, and pushing, um, pushing the insurgents in the direction of another element that was to cordon them off and uh, confront them. <laughs> and so that that mission took almost probably two weeks. It probably took about two weeks, and it was just hiking and hiking and hiking. And uh, at one point, we ran out of food. And uh, and water, and they resupplied us with ammo instead of food and water, and so we we actually had to call a halt for one whole day. Uh, you know, it was just a lot of physicality, a lot of hiking, a lot of mountains, and uh, that was intense. Well, I carried uh, my AR-15 and uh, seven rounds, full combat load, or seven mags, sorry, seven magazines, and uh, on my uh, front loading. Load-bearing vest. I carried. Uh, I had a quick pouch that I had some medical, uh, some of the clotting bandages that I had, and I, uh, I carried a London Bridge uh, aid bag that weighed about uh, 20, 30 pounds. Uh, you know, if packed clear full. And um, depend on it depended on the mission. A lot of times, like if we were going on a hell on on the hell hike, we we would carry a rucksack. With our food, our water, and our bedding, and uh, and then I would have my aid bag on top of that. So it would it would vary on the mission, but sometimes I would be very weighed down. That and the body armor and the helmet and the so very weight, very very heavily equipped. Sometimes we would do like an air uh, an uh, air assault with a Chinook and be dropped off, and that would be by foot. And then every now and then we would do a truck mission where sometimes we could leave our gear on the trucks. And drive around, but most most of the hiking was done without the trucks. Mm-hmm. I remember uh, we had set up a patrol base on top of a mountain, and uh, we had a Guardian newspaper gentleman with us, mm-hmm. and uh, I was up with the command team, uh, sleeping with the radio guy and uh, the cameraman, the Guardian new- journalist. He had uh, not brought any; he didn't bring anything. And uh, he went around asking people, and he ended up having to share with us. <laughs> and so uh, we couldn't incorporate him into our guard shift. But <laughs> I remember the awkwardness of him having never done it. And yeah. we were like, no, dude, this is exactly what you have to do to survive. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, good stuff. yeah. 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 <laughs>
before we deployed, we were responsible with training several of our uh, people up to, up to the level of uh, combat casualty care to, to become a, um, the term is a, I can't remember the term, but uh, but they would be an assistant to the to the medic, and I had three guys that I had trained up to that level, and uh, one of them for sure I could I could rely on. Mm -hmm. So there was a there were several times I had to I had to have their assistance. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, several mass casualties that needed some assistance sure. with. But the my my platoon was understaffed. Understaffed. We were about we would range depending on who was on leave and who was who was uh, back, we would range anywhere between uh, 18 and 20-some guys, so very on the smaller end of a platoon. Um, my first mass casualty was in that Gwashtaw Pass mission on our way to Afghan, or on our way to the Waziqwa, our main base. Um, we had been driving probably a week or two weeks into the mission, we had already passed uh, Kushmand, and we were in the pass, in the Gwashtaw Pass. Um, we had told the Afghan nationals that were with us not to, not to leave the path because only the path that the vehicles were on had been cleared of mines. I don't think that everyone with us had gotten that information. It was a large, com a very large convoy. We must have stretched a mile, a mile and a half. How many, how many vehicles if you had to I can't, I'm, me? Uh, more than 50, more than 50, yeah, yeah, but probably less than 100, but there were a lot. Yeah. Most of them were uh, local national, what we call jingle trucks, uh, and they were carrying all of our supplies, our food and our fuel, a lot of fuel that we were carrying for our trucks down to the base. Um, these guys decided, the truck drivers decided that during one of our stops they would get out and uh, have prayer, and they, we were in a draw, so we needed, they needed to get out and uh, up on a hill and, and to be able to express themselves. And uh, on their way up, one of the gentlemen stepped on an IED and uh, <clears throat> he was unrecoverable, but uh, several of his companions that had joined him in up, going up the hill, I think there were four in the initial blast and there were several others injured in the uh, uh, secondary uh, explosions and further out from the blast, less, less damaged people. Uh, but my first casualty had his uh, right leg nearly amputated up at the right at the hip joint, and uh, he had uh, shrapnel all through his back and and chest. Uh, his right arm had been blown in half, uh, so that his he only had three fingers on one hand, and uh, his face was disfigured quite quite badly. And that was my first patient. Um, he did not make it. Um, there were several others, and uh, uh, I was the only medic on site for about 15 minutes before the other medic was able to uh, find a clear path up the uh, convoy to get to me. And by the time he got there, we had, uh, we had established a uh, casualty collection point and started triaging and had already called up a nine line. I think we ended up evacuating um, no one because they were all local nationals. So they weren't allowed to be uh, transported by, by our air assets. Was that, was that hard though to see them like not get the resources that they needed? It was a little hard. Um, definitely, it, it, it was hard, it was hard. We, we, I gave them a, a litter for the ones that had died and uh, we, I, we helped strap them to the top of the trucks and uh, we drove them back. The, uh, a few of them decided that be, uh, Muslim religion uh, dictates that you need to be buried before the sun sets that, or otherwise your body is not clean. And so uh, there were several of the group that decided against our orders uh, to stay put that they carried the bodies out and buried them. And so I remember um, knowing that some of them had been men that I treated that had had made it, but then had later died, so had later succumbed to their wounds. So, so that part was was hard. Um, the the adrenaline rush you you get um, if you don't if you don't if you're not familiar with it or if you if you don't know how to uh, um, utilize it, it can drive you into a panic and you can become shaky and. 
So that's something I feel like you can never really fully be prepared for without being put into a situation like that, right? And so that was probably the biggest part was the this is real and uh, the gut check that came with that. You know, like this man's life is, uh, he's relying on me and I need to perform and so the the pressure is is intense. Sure. Yeah. What was the first American casualty you you helped? Uh, it was actually a very minor injury. Uh, he fortunately, uh, he was a husky driver for an engineer company that was uh, clearing the road for us. Uh, responsible for like the mine scanners and the the um, the mine rollers and the radar detectors that they had on those huskies. Uh, he was driving the husky and. I forget exactly how he managed to strike this ID, but he struck it, and uh, it had turned his vehicle on its on its top, and they had to cut him out of the bottom. And uh, I treated him for a concussion, and we medevaced him. I assisted uh, approximately a dozen or so soldiers while I was in Afghanistan. Mostly rolled ankles and uh, dehydration, but some other sure. serious things. That was something that blew me away about our deployment is that we had so few people. I mean, you know, Martin Egan Andrews and uh, um, Sergeant B, Sergeant B, Sergeant. Um, there was Boy, no. Clayton. Um, there were a lot. But yeah. uh, I was surprised we didn't have more, right? Clayton like, Bowen? Bowen, Sergeant Bowen. Bowen, that's right. Um, Kurt, I was surprised Kurt we didn't have more because of the, several of the instances, like uh, like every single one of the people in my platoon hit an ID. And um, not one of us suffered se serious injuries. I got a little gash over my eye, my, and, a, and one guy, um, I think he had another gash over his head, but that was, that was it. And, I mean, we had guys, I had a guy get shot in the foot. Uh, Wolf was his name, he got shot in the foot. And, um, that was it. I don't even think anybody caught one in the sappies. I mean, we were very fortunate that they just didn't know how to shoot at all. <laughs> like, it's not that they weren't shooting at us, because I, I remember the zip and crack and the feeling that, you know, the, one, the couple times I got the gun. But nobody was shot. <laughs> so... We were very, 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 very fortunate. I remember looking out the one of my MRAPs, and we got ambushed from the from the left, which was a mountain that came up, and then there was a the rest of it kept going down, and we were on a dark donkey cart, and there were some guys in a little house, and it did look like it had been used recently, so we stopped and sent a little team out there to look, and the team had circled around the well, and an RPG came flying up and hit the well, right, right, all three of them standing right there, not a single one was hurt. Not even like a perforated eardrum. And, you know, one guy, he hit the ground, he hit the ground, and he landed on a stick, and he thought that he was hurt. Mm. You know, but like, <laughs> we were very, very fortunate. I remember one RPG, that same ambush, uh, one RPG had hit the top of a, uh, the MRAP in front of us and skipped and landed against the uh, turret, but they had forgotten to pull the pin on the top of it. So it was a dud. And we were like, that would have killed you or hurt you or really messed you, blown your eardrums out or something. But they forgot to pull the pin. <laughs> so, I mean, either they're really dumb or there's a god. <laughs> so, I, and I'm on the fence. I don't know which. <laughs> like, they are really dumb. Yeah. Don't know what they're doing. You know, they're not dumb. They're just untrained. How genuinely important is it for you to trust the man on your left and the man on your right, the other people in your pl platoon. Is it, is it true when people say that, you know, like they would rather do stuff for their, their platoon mates than family members? Mm. You know, like give me some insight, I guess, into the, uh, the relationship you have with the other men that you are together with in war. That's a mixed bag. I, I, uh... I would say it, it's situational. I, I was in two different platoons within Apache Company, and um, that's because there was some some uh, interpersonal drama in the first platoon that I was with, and 
So it depends. It depends on who your leaders are. It depends on what kind of a group of people come together. It's very, dyna very dynamic and uh, different. Um, I would say I would do anything for those brothers of mine that we suffered through with. But then uh, I think just like any family, you have the oddballs or the people that really were just uh, nasty or, or you know mean senselessly. And I think those individuals are, are my brothers, you know, and I would do a lot for them. Um, but I would say it's definitely situationally based. You know, it, it might sound arrogant or like unforgiving of me, but um, we were all suffering over there. And if you were there making the suffering worse, you know, yeah. so there's no love lost between those individuals. But I would say the vast majority of Joes, you know, of guys sucking in the combat field, yeah, they're, they're brothers, and, and there is that bond because you do rely on them. You do 100%. The guy to your left and right, maybe not the guy above you <laughs> or below you, but definitely the guy to your left and right, your peers, uh, you, you, you rely heavily on them uh, from everything from... <clears throat> sharing water when you're running low on a really long hike to uh, just a quick PMCI real quick before you before you head out or before you go see your sergeant, you know, make sure, all right, you got everything, got everything, you know. And the camaraderie too, you know, there's nothing, misery loves company. You don't want to be out there in the rain and the in the knee-high mud, you know, sleeping with <laughs> under the stars and be alone. Like nobody wants to do that. You get back from Afghanistan. You're after all the, the the travel going back. You're back in Alaska. What were your kind of first thoughts coming back? You know, you you, you land back at your base. You're driving. What was going through your your head? There had been so much stuff. I was, I I was stuck thinking this wasn't real. You know that that the last year of my life had been a dream, or I was waiting to to wake up. It just felt so surreal that. Just everything uh, felt so unbelievable. Uh, it, it it had been so fresh. I mean, we were we were performing missions up until two weeks before I flew back, and so it felt very strange to be drinking a beer when two weeks ago I had been uh, doing what we had been doing. Yeah. I was restationed uh, to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I was attached to a medical support unit there, the 36th ASMC. You deployed with them, didn't you? I did. As a squad leader, I deployed as the... Uh, uh, I, I ended up working as the NCOIC of the uh, night shift for the clinic. It was in uh, FOB Freedom. Uh, and uh, No, I'm sorry. It was on FOB Liberty. FOB Liberty. Yeah, in Iraq. There you go. Uh, that was actually a very short deployment. We were there from, July, from early July until October, middle of October. Yeah. A lot was different. Uh, I had been promoted, so that was a that was a good th difference. I was receiving better pay, and I had a better position management and um, some responsibility, so that felt good. But at the time, I had been dealing with uh, a viral disease called shingles that uh, repetitively uh, attacked my body and ended up uh, bringing me home early from Iraq. Uh, about two weeks early than the rest of my unit. Um, the shingles, they say, was related to the stress of the deployment and the uh, perhaps the burn pits that were that we were exposed to might have lowered my immune system. But uh, pain was the second biggest thing I had to deal with on that on my second deployment from the shingles. The sad truth about Iraq was. Uh, that we were there during the shutdown, and so we were not being used as an aid station per se. We were more more there to r remove the equipment that was there. We were taking accountability of all the medical equipment that was being used at that aid station and at several others. We were responsible for shutting them down. Uh, so not a lot of Americans were treated, but my clinic had to respond several times to uh, mortuary affairs and to suicides. And that was the bulk of my uh, casualties that I dealt with in Iraq were suicides. 
Wh- which one would you rather do again, knowing that you would come out safe? Do I have to do one? No, you don't. No. 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 Well, I wouldn't. You know, no, I- <laughs> <laughs> it's in the past. <laughs> right. We'll leave. Right. <laughs> so you get back from Iraq. Were you just as relieved, more relieved, less relieved than when you got back from Afghanistan? I was. I was far less relieved. Yeah. I was far less relieved. I, my situation had gone uh, pretty poorly. I, my health had degraded very rapidly. I was, in my, I was in my prime before when I deployed to Afghanistan. And uh, when I came back from Iraq, uh, I was a mess. I was shingles. I couldn't sleep. Uh, a lot of things going on. I was discharged in uh, September of 2013. How was your initial let's just say one year after you got out of the army. So you get your DD-214, saying you're a, a, a free man now. Um, what was that first year like, transitioning from a very kind of more rigid military life to basically being able to do whatever you wanted to? That was hard. That was very hard. I was fortunate I, I was I'm married, and uh, my wife is a registered nurse. And so when we got out, we decided that we would sell the house. And... Uh, we bought an RV and we traveled uh, the United States with her doing travel nursing. And so I had that, and that was good. But as far as myself and my direction and my motivation, that was very difficult for me. It was a, a hard transition, sure. working with the VA and uh, trying to understand my, my disease that I was dealing with and uh, a lot of things going on at that time. Was there any hardship mentally that you, you faced going from something as rigid as a military schedule to not having that structure there anymore? Absolutely. I feel that uh, one of those struggles was definitely depression. Uh, Definitely a chemical depression from living in Alaska for three years, being away from the sun, Um, but also the lack of uh, purpose. And uh, like you said, uh, the change and the transition from a regimented lifestyle to a liberated lifestyle. Uh, the, the aimlessness that you face is very difficult. I think the the thing that the military least prepared me for was uh, empathy, <laughs> for having the ability to, uh, to care about other people's uh, feelings. You know, I think the military is it's easy to like feelings are not on the agenda. You know, and so that's something that. I think I, I, may, I may have even had before I joined the Army, but definitely lost uh, throughout, my, throughout my term. Definitely lost the ability to have, or maybe not lost it completely, but it degraded. So You mm. get one, one word mm. to, to best describe your entire military experience. Mm. Man. I can't have like a word like super califragilistic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can have, I'll give you. If, um, if you want to have. Can like, I make up like words? Phrase, you know, like it was like. One, you know, I can keep it at one word. Yeah, I can keep like it at one totally word. Totally badass or something like that. I would that's, be that's like. Cool. I would say entropic. <laughs> there are. Just over 3 million Iraq and Afghanistan veterans Mm. that live in the United States. Mm. What advice would you give to other veterans that are maybe struggling, maybe not sure about their kind of place in the world, whether it's family-related, career-related? I mean, would you you say anything to them? Mm. Hmm. That's a tough one. I would say that resilience is probably the best trait that you could have and that, uh, let me think, if I could tell all three million of them one thing. Or or if you want to break it down, you, you certainly can. I think what I would tell them is to be proud of who they are and to not forget that they 
they might not have, their purpose might not be clear now, but they had a purpose and they, they served it very well. And so they should take pride in that. And they should say, they should say, or I would say to them that that is, that is value. You, that it may be in your past, but that is value, and you should uh, don't be discouraged just because you're not doing that anymore. You did it, and that's still impressive. What advice or what what words of veteranly wisdom would you give to somebody who might be thinking about going into the military in 2019 or 2020, yeah. regardless if it's the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force? Yeah. Would you would you tell them anything? Well. So, I would tell someone going into the army right now or the military, I would tell them uh, to have a plan and to not take anything personally. That you're gonna you're gonna meet a lot of people that are gonna be really hard on you, but they're gonna be hard on you to shape you into what you need to be, and to not take that personally. I wish I I had done that. And that second thing is to have a plan. Don't don't believe the sergeant when he says you'll never make it in the on the outside. You'll never make it like. You can, it's doable, and if you have a plan, it's, it's possible. The experience was intense and draining. Um, but now, 10 years separate from it, you can look back on some of it and uh, be proud or be, or be uh, um, uh, Expressive of your pride, you know, like you can. I don't know. But it's it's hard when you first when you first are there and you. I feel like now I have a better appreciation for what I was doing then because at that moment it's so chaotic and you and you can't really see the big picture of like what are we doing here and why and and it's it's very chaotic and it's easy to get caught up in the. Like, forget this. Like, let's just get out of here and ditch this place. I remember that was my attitude at the end. I had, I had gone in with the bleeding heart, you know, trying to help everybody, trying to make the biggest difference. And I left the most jaded, angry, uh, hateful person, you know. And um, I think that's what that kind of experience is due to you. Sure. You know, you can't. Do, do what we did and, and come out like skipping and jumping, you know, like the Care Bears don't do what we, what we did. And uh, so probably one of the hardest things has been like getting that back, getting back my heart, <laughs> you know, getting back my heart. From veteran to veteran, what was the most emotional moment of your military career? A lot of it was very emotional, but probably the most intense emotion I experienced. Uh, there was a gentleman on that same big mission. That was that one big mission. Is a lot of lot happened. One of the patients that I treated, I saved his life. Uh, it was a very traumatic wound. He had ended up amputating his right leg, and uh, I saved his life. And he was an Afghan national. And um, I remember getting back from the from an air assault patrol, I got off the helicopter, I was walking into uh, the Wazakwa aid station, and as I dropped my gear, I saw a man sitting on the stoop, and another man came up out of nowhere and grabbed me and hugged me. And um, I didn't know what was going on at first, but then I realized this was the son of the man I had saved, and that was the man. And we had a reunion, and uh, that was a very emotional moment because it was, uh, <coughs> I saw my actions impact the world there, and so I, I had a moment where I, I don't know, a lot of realizations hit me, and uh, it was a very emotional moment for me. So.